Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. The prospective sale of the historic Van Cortlandt Jewish Center has raised the concern of many in the surrounding community. The negotiations by President Stu Harris and Board Chair Jack Kleinfeld with a for-profit company called Innovative are being conducted in secret a fact that many say is a problem on its face. Unfortunately, the Bronx has seen these kinds of anti-community projects over the years. We did invite both VCJC president and chair to represent their interests on the program tonight, but they declined, wanting to continue to operate in secret. So we invited a couple of members of the VCJC congregation to review what's at stake, not only for the congregation, but for the local residents, if the 33,000 square foot property that is in the center of a transportation hub on Sedgwick Avenue and mostly a stable community is sold to a for-profit developer who has no connections or responsibility to the Bronx community. In fact, earlier this year, Community Board 8 urged Innovative to communicate with community members, but to date, they have not. In our studio are a couple of members of the VC con VCJC congregation who have concerned about the process and if this unfortunate deal goes through, what it will mean for the synagogue and the surrounding Van Cortlandt Village, Amalgamated Park Reservoir, Mutual Kingsbridge, and Kingsbridge Heights neighborhoods. So, please join me in welcoming two members of the Van Cortlandt Jewish Salander Center. It is Louise Salant, nice to see you. Hi, Gary. Thank you. And uh, Michael Stoller, nice to see you, mm -hmm. sir. Um, we will um, uh, talk about this, and I have to start with a, a personal note, which I rarely do. I can't deny that this is uh, the Jewish center where I uh, was, went to Hebrew school. I was bar mitzvahed. I was married there. My family had been involved there. So this is a very personal uh, issue for me. And so while, as you know, very often I don't uh, get involved in what the guests are doing, in this case, it'll be hard for me to resist. If we could put that picture up again so people would know. On the left, that is you, Louise Salant, at, uh, I guess, 1965 when they opened this building. On the top right is Michael Stoller's Bar Mitzvah <laughs> certificate when in 1964 wow. in the old building yeah. he had his Bar Mitzvah. Bottom, right, bottom left is Gary's Bar Mitzvah and the bottom right is Gary's wedding. We have had a long uh, history with the oh, Van yeah. Cortland Jewish Center. We just wanted to establish that. Um, let's um, talk with you, Louise. Um, what is problematic for you about all the negotiations of the prospective sale of this building being in secret? The problem is when something is done in secret, it makes me wonder what do the parties involved have to hide? So those are unanswered questions for me. Another problem is it does not make it possible to speak about alternatives that might be better than the deal that's going on. And uh, I mean, we both know, and, and I have been involved in some of those discussions. Again, as I said, personally, I've been involved in this. Um, many uh, alternatives or, were presented, but were not followed up on. And, and is there, do we, do we have an understanding of why that is the case or it, it would seem that there's some agenda here, unstated. They didn't want to, it's Jack Kleinfeld is the chair and Stu Harris is the president. They were invited. They didn't uh, want to come on here. Um, just your thoughts about, uh, about you know, the, this whole specter of alternatives being considered, not being considered and what's really going on here. There were some options about contacting some nonprofit organizations. And Jack had said that he had contacted it. And then I was told by, uh, I believe, Laura, mm -hmm. that another, another one of the people who's been involved, that they there had did. been no contact made. I think it was made. the Council of Churches yeah. and mm -hmm. also Fordham Bedford Housing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about the history of, of the relationships with uh, not-for-profits. Um, uh, Michael, just let's just talk about um, the, the responsibility that a religious institution might have to the community. I established that many people in the community are not happy with what they're hearing. He's contended that the responsibility, um, their responsibility is only to the congregation. Uh, do they have an obligation to be mindful of the needs of the surrounding community that has supported it for generations like we all have because we have, you know, our families have been members, we all 
participated in activities, et cetera, et cetera, um, both in, in this location and you were bar mitzvahed in, in the old location on Gouverneur Avenue. Remind me how old I am. <laughs> um, I guess so. Yeah, th there's a concept in Judaism called Tikkun Olam. It's not in the Torah, not in the Jewish Bible. It's from the Talmud, which is a compendium of rabbinic thought for many, many years. And the idea behind Tikkun Olam is you is you're doing the right thing. Heal the world. Heal the world is what it actually means. Um, the idea being that the world is broken and our job as humans living on this planet is to do our part, whatever it is, in doing the right thing, in, in repairing the world, in being responsible for each other and for the world around us and the community. What's mind boggling in terms of that for a synagogue, one of the things that our group was trying to get the uh, leadership of this world to do is uh, have part of the development be senior housing. Amalgamated, which is most of the neighborhood, is in bad trouble financially. And let's just add that the people at Amalgamated, uh, which included my grandparents, which goes back a long way, have supported the, the Van Cortlandt Jewish Center oh, from the beginning of time. members. And, you know, they talked about there used to be 700 members. That's largely where those members yeah. came my from. Grand, my grandparents were amalgamated. Right. And they belonged to the shul. Um, so you have the, the competition, which is what Jack is asking for, is market rate housing. When Amalgamated raises the rents, which it seems it's going to keep doing because of their, of their own financial They've got big issues over there, yeah. Where are these people going to go? These are older people who've been there their entire lives. This is their community. The, the neighborhood is their home, not their apartment. And this so be it would be nice, and, and in fact, I've talked about it in, in my own home, if we decide we wanted to downsize a little bit, getting a little older, Gary is still on TV, we know that, <laughs> but it, maybe at some point he won't be, and we want to uh, go to a place and keep stay in our neighborhood. Yeah. Um, I'm, I just want to get back to this whole idea of heal the world. So if this is coming out of the Talmud, yes. what you're saying is that the VCJC president, Stu Harris, uh, the chairman, Jack Kleinfeld, and even the rabbi, his name is Rabbi Lowenstein. I believe so, right? the new guy. Um, they all support the plan. They're actually going against traditional Jewish uh, principles ethics. And, and ethics. Yeah, absolutely. They should be foremost thinking about the effect this will have on their community. We're talking seniors who will live there forever. It's not like... People they don't know. You, you know what I noticed? Um, maybe you folks saw it and, and the general public may have seen it. This week in the Riverdale Press, the first story is how the Church of the Mediator in Kingsbridge is um, working on a food insecurity program. Yeah. There's a, some local people who want to do that. And I was thinking about that in this context. So on one hand, this church is doing something for the community. On the other hand, the, the VCJC is ready to sell it. So you th you think, and I assume you think as well, that they have a responsibility to the community, at least to communicate. If I can add one thing about yeah, seniors. please. The, the synagogue housed uh, JASA Senior Center. Right. My mother was a member of it before she went into a right. home. And, and I think you know my mom was too. Yes, she was. Um, then we'd go together. Um, <laughs> the Jack apparently scared the JASA people by saying the sale was imminent. It wasn't imminent. It hasn't even happened yet. And so they had to vacate. And there was an article in that same issue of the Riverdale Press about how there are people who, are in, who used to go to the center who can't because it's just too far away. Um, we, we can, we'll talk about that in a moment. What I want to do is let's get a picture. I, I want to show people what is at stake and that it's not just Gary had this personal issue that he's bringing up here. So here's what the Van Cortland Jewish Center looks like. That's right on Cedric Avenue. Uh, on the interior, uh, it is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It's uh, historic. Uh, and what some people don't know, those plaques that are, those stained glass um, plaques were from the World's Fair in 1964. So yeah. there's a bit of history in there. Um, but I also want to show spatially what it looks like and what the challenges are for the neighborhood. And the reason this is important to the people of the Bronx is because this is the kind of thing that's going on everywhere. Unfortunate, in this case, it's coming out of a religious institution yeah. uh, selling to a not-for-profit developer. So this is Cedric Avenue on the top that people can see. Um, you can see the large Van Cortlandt Jewish Center, and they also own a house that's to the bottom of the screen. But the public library building that's to the left was also sold to Innovative. The house to the left of it was also sewn to Innovative. 
uh, the house further to the left, all the way to the left side of your screen, was sold to Innovative. The, the other house was sold to another for-profit company. If, in fact, the VCJC sells that property, look at the size of the development and, and the plans are for market rate housing. Yeah. Look at the size of the development destroying the trees, the greenery and everything else. Um, um, Michael, what, what, and both of you, we'll start with you, Michael. What, what's your thought when you see that? I mean, I'm, you live across the street. I, across the I live <laughs> across the street from there, too. Let's be clear. Yeah, I live um, on the other side of the street. Uh, I'm terrified because this is it, on two levels. One is it's a great neighborhood. I grew up there. I'm in the apartment I grew up in. It's, a, you know, that's one. And two is it, it's a, this, the synagogue and the houses around it are a central part of the neighborhood. They do have the trees. They have, um, it's a welcoming situation. If you knock it down and put up some building, and we have no idea what kind of building we're talking about because Jack and Sue, as Louise said, have kept everything secret, even from the rest of the congregation. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what it's going to be. We don't know how welcoming it is. And be. they have specifically denied input from community members. I, I think I was asked and you were asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement yep. that we wouldn't talk about it. Of course, I wouldn't do that because I do this for a living. So I uh, uh, would, would, yeah. would not it, do anything like and, that. And it's, what's interesting is you're talking about long-term members. It's not like people have just walked in. Louise has been there since she was born. I was there since I was born. You, Gar Gary, yep. volunteers the same thing. Yeah. Um, Louise, your thoughts about uh, about the notion of um, uh, that whole plot of land changing? How will that affect the community? It's it's. I was horrified because I did not have a visual picture prior to this that you're showing Until us. what I showed. Yeah. To, to, I think the aerial gives you an idea of the size mm -hmm. of the property. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What what worries me further? looking ahead is that this is just one step. If the VCJC is and the other, the Canners building are sold to Innovative, they're going to have a big foothold into the neighborhood. So it's, we're not just talking about this little area here. We're talking about the impact on the rest of the community, the out, the, that you mentioned earlier. It will, the development is going to continue and it's going to be the death of not only this art, this community here, but all around us too. It, you know, I was on a tour of the facility with a not-for-profit developer uh, with a long history of CORD, just what you were talking about earlier, we mentioned Fordham Bedford Housing. This was another organization uh, that uh, has involved in all these kinds of projects to renovate the projects. And, and I was one of the people who brought in uh, this potential developer. And he was told by Mr. Kleinfeld that uh, he, Kleinfeld, had a contract ready to be signed on his computer. And so that basically scared him away. He said, I'm not going to sit here. And if he's ready to do it, I, I don't want to start negotiating. But the fact is, they revealed recently the, that they're still working on the contract because they had some difference of uh, the way the thing should be handled. And, and, sorry, go ahead. There are some... some Conf there's conflicting information here because Jack says the sale is imminent, the contract is is ready to be signed. Well, that's signed. what he told the developer, and he scared him away. Mm -hmm. And in in the meantime, he's saying the reason we have to hurry up and vote for the sale, we have to slay for death, we have to sell to innovative is there's no there's no other option, which, which is, is which, not true, which isn't which true. Already established. Yeah. Um, also, the land hasn't even been accurately appraised. Yeah, there's been no assessment. There's been no, no assessment, and the the library next door, I understand, went for. One point nine million dollars to innovative. The shul is not going for a whole lot more, and it's such a larger it's piece of property. Piece of so why are we? Be, why is it being undersold? And mm -hmm. also, Jack is saying, "Oh, the shul is going to be bankrupt." Well, he's driven <laughs> out. So, so let, let's do that. I, I've got a quote that's in, in, in a um, uh, from the Riverdale Press, okay. literally this week from one of the members. So the, the headline was Jewish Center's Kleinfeld should apologize and resign. Uh, it was written by a man named Fischl Bezer, who's also been involved in, he's a, a member of the center. Mr. Kleinfeld has effectively driven away one of the center's rent paying tenants, the JASA Older Adult Center. He has created a self-fulfilling prophecy of bankrupting the Jewish Center and preparing the building for the wrecking ball. Basically what I understand, and I know this pretty well, um, 
he told them a year ago that the building right. was going to be sold. So JASA uh, then went and found other um, uh, uh, another facility and literally moved out. They provided, Michael was talking about his mom, I know my mom, uh, uh, went for senior lunches every I day. Was, I was is, a member. I'm a member as well. well. I have there many friends there who are broken hearted that there's no longer any place to go where, where yeah. you can the, have lunch. The, the new place is uh, on 231st. Uh, 231st Street. 231st. Yeah, I know where it is. I, we should mention for folks who don't know, JASA is the Jewish Association serving the agent right. that had run that highly effective uh, program yeah. at the VCJC. I used to work for JASA. It's a good organization. It's a very good organization. And I, 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 I want to ask you something about what we both know. There was a deal with the Van Cortlandt Jewish Center yes. five years ago that JASA was going to buy the center and then presumably continue its yeah. services, provide space for the congregation. JASA has a wonderful reputation for the uh, buildings that they own. They own throughout the city. Um, the guy who's ahead of it is a personal friend. He knows the stuff. They're fair. He, he told us recently that if Jack had obstructed it, had three, not obstructed. Had not obstructed. Three years ago, there would have been a ribbon cutting now. It, right. This would be over. And a JASA facility and, would be And there. I think what's interesting in what he told them, according to JASA, I was part of that same meeting you were in. Yep. What he told them was um, it can't be done fast enough because we, we don't have the money. And yet, and I should mention, which was on, on a document that they um, circulated, the JASA was paying $78,000 a year rent. Had they not told them to leave, they'd still be collecting that rent. And that, that imperative that you talked about would, would, would not be there. Would not, not be, not be uh, on the table. JASA did not want to leave. JASA put it off as long as possible. Yeah. But they had to take care of the older folks, which the synagogue is not doing. Which, which is, again, goes back to, to your Tikkun original Olam. point, Tikkun Olam. Um, now, what is the status of, of the contract? Now, you attended a meeting that was, uh, I think, June 30th, so it's just a couple of weeks ago. Um, what, is, what, where, what do we know about the contract? Precious little. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. It's a serious yeah, matter, of course. They haven't, I don't know if the re, a contract really exists or not. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen any, plan. We haven't seen any documentation. What, what, as I understand, and what you told me about the meeting, was that if, in fact, um, the congregation was a, um, a tenant of the new building, the new yeah. market rate building, then it puts the congregation in potential peril because the building could be sold. They could ultimately lose their lease. Tenants all across the Bronx know exactly what we're talking about, unfortunately. And so, so it's not providing security. They kind of agreed with that. So now they held back on signing the contract, trying to basically redo a full... Um, a, a, a fundamental part of the contract. Yeah. So um, yeah, they wanted to now, on our suggestion, they're talking about a condo as opposed to a lease. So that they would, they would own, own the property. Exactly, I'll own put some peace within the building. And, and um, you know, that, that certainly makes sense, but that is a fundamental precept of the contract. In other words, are you going to be a tenant? I mean, so that would mean a serious thing. And also we haven't seen it, so we don't know what, what the truth nobody, is. Right, no, no, again, it's a secret deal. Right. Um, uh, let, let's just talk about um, that uh, whole uh, notion a little bit about uh, the fact that um, there, there's no contract out there. And what you told me was that they also decided and agreed to not consider alternatives <laughs> at this point. So I was thinking about that. Think about that. So you, you're negotiating a deal with a developer, whatever the deal is, and then you agree that you're not going to consider alternatives. <laughs> Who did you just put all of the all of the leverage on? Because they can say, well, we don't we don't really want to do whatever it is you're asking. We don't want to pay more. We don't want to give you the space you need. We don't want to create a condo agreement, or we're trying to create a condo agreement. But um, Gary, you, you have nothing to stand on. It, 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 there's something illogical about. What you're saying is makes total sense, which shows how the deal makes no sense. We're not asking miracles. We're not saying the building can survive on its own. But this, what, what's happening there doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, you and I, Michael, were part of a future committee five years ago. Yeah. And um, I, I can tell you that I, through my, some of my many contacts in the Bronx, I brought in a developer who wanted to build a charter school there, which also would serve the community, 
um, and they also would have been friendly to the community, et cetera, et cetera. But they told me um, very recently they couldn't work with Mr. Kleinfeld. They said that he, they used language that I wouldn't repeat on television, but they said he was um, not, not uh, Because possible. he's driving away any options, because yeah. for, obviously- For some reason- For some reason, we don't know what it is. Now, if it's speed, because they have no money, of course, he drove them away, and that's why they have no money. And um, if there's something else going on, of course, uh, none of us can- um, can, uh, They've also been refusing members. The other thing which I have to say, and, and you guys know about this, is a personal matter to me. They have rejected people who want to be members, <laughs> including me, who want to be members of the congregation. Now, you shared with me some of... Now, I received a letter telling me they didn't want me to have influence on the, on the prospects for the, for the sale, which, of course, who has more influence than I do being on television? But you sent me a. a, a there were a two letters of, of rejection. Of rejection, but they had another uh, item they put in there, it's, which was very odd. I it thought. was it was odd to me. It said because someone lived in Riverdale, it was too far away for that person to attend the Shabbat services. Therefore, so words, they, they, they didn't live in the area. Yes. Therefore, they would their membership was rejected because they lived too far away. So then they are evaluating. Like somebody's Religious level of observance. Jewishness yeah. or whatever. Okay. Uh, the ability to attend Shabbat services. That's not. Uh, it's not that in their is, bylaws or The bylaws like simply state anyone of Jewish faith is eligible for membership. Uh, Michael, I told some people um, that, that I had been rejected who know my long history. You saw some pictures there. My, and, and again, it's, it's not about me, it's about a much larger thing. And they said, can you imagine? They rejecting paying members. Can you imagine any religious institution <laughs> rejecting people who want to support financially? They sent me my check back. By the way. And also, I mean, just to, to add to the absurdity of it, we were on the future committee. Yes, you were an honoree. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> Every year they honor someone. It's a fundraiser, like many nonprofits do. Gary was you were an honoree. They were honoring your. My work here on television and my service to the community. They and did. to the synagogue. And to the synagogue. And my family's long mm -hmm. four Your grandfather was, was a founder. <laughs> and they won't let you be a member. So what, it, what this says to me is that the board does not want anyone to become a member who is not in favor of the sale. Exactly. What, what um, happens to the congregation while there's construction? Just for example, assuming the building is going to be sold, whether it's sold to this developer or another, I mean, one would think that would have to be considered, and one would think the board and the members, like you folks, would ask that question, like, you know, where, where are what go? are we going to do? All right, this, the sale cannot be concluded until the, unless there is a place for the synagogue to go. So the synagogue is supposed to be housed with an innovative, but if innovative takes several years to build, where is the synagogue going in the meantime? Right. Nobody knows. As far as I know, well, no arrangements have been made. Here's the thing. You know, you say, as far as I know, as far as I know, as far as you know, that's the problem with operating in secret. Mm -hmm. And Correct. so you rile up a lot of people. You end up getting a TV show when you don't come on the program <laughs> to talk for yourself, where people are, are speculating if they don't like that idea, then represent yourself. They, they don't uh, seem to want to do that. W what's the, the play out now? So, so, um, uh, Let's just say they proceed, they arrange some contract, God willing, which is a funny word to use in this <laughs> concept, that they will, uh, they will uh, share it with, with the, um, the members before they get to vote, maybe even with the general public, although we think right now they're going to close the public out of it. Um, so then what, what do you folks want to, okay. to see happen? There's a couple of steps. Um, one that we don't think will happen, but if the board realizes that they're being played, then they could stop the sale. So the board could then say, you know what, we Let's really back. should consider yeah. other alternatives. Exactly. Because they, they know, you know, the congregation shrunk from 700 to 55. Uh, they need to do something. We understand that. So that's one thing. The second thing is the membership is supposed to vote to approve this deal once the deal is finalized. That implies that they're actually going to get to see the papers that the would make sure. I think it's been suggested that they, they would in fact do that. And so that's a membership. But the thing that we're doing, another attorney and I are, are contacting the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General is responsible for sales or long-term leases of religious institutions. 
she has to approve them or send them to the state Supreme Court to approve. But somebody outside... Has to review this as opposed to a private sale, which is where all those other private houses exactly. went. And if any, if any okay. member sure. objects to the sale, the attorney general has to do an investigation. That could take a year, could take longer. And so and what's going to happen? But since I'm not a member, I can't raise my hand, but both of you are going to raise your hands and object, <laughs> and of course, object to the sale. Of course. Sale. So we, then what's going to happen? So the sale that is, they're so desperate, certain people are so desperate to complete, cannot be completed until the attorney general okays it, and there will have to be an investigation. And I know some people have already written letters. Yes. And, I, so and we, filed. So we have a, a, an address, we can put that up on the screen, of um, uh, the Attorney General for anybody interested in this. This would be for people who are members, people who are not members, Community people members. in the communities, Kingsbridge Heights, who want, to, um, uh, who want to contact the Attorney General. Uh, you can use the complaint form, which you can find right there. Uh, but you can contact the, the Attorney General, Letitia James, in her New York City office down there at 416-8400. So um, what do we think? What, what, what do you think is next? Well, I think the, <laughs> that the outlying community needs needs to be, all of you listening now, <laughs> okay. who who may live outside of Amalgamated or Park Reservoir, who may not and be mutual. members of the shul and mutual, <laughs> Thank you. Um, remember that this is just the first step in development. And don't think that you won't be priced out of where you're living. This is just the beginning. It would be nice to have, an alt speaking of alternatives, an alternative for people in the area for a place to live that's affordable. Yeah. Listen, we got to run. Uh, Louise Salant, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so my much pleasure. for your passion. It's nice to still be neighbors. And to you, my longtime friend, Michael Stoller, nice to see you as always. Nice thank to be you. neighbors. And uh, we'll try to do what's right for the community, regardless of what other people say. All right. Um, and listen, next week, a uh, different, totally different show. Congressman Richie Torres will join us to talk about the race for president and other issues. We'll probably talk about Israel as well. Thanks to our producer, Rebecca Hemick. Our director is Will Guzman. The editor is Jesse Diaz. We have a cast of thousands around us here in the studio. And of course, to you too, people of the Bronx, without you, we got nothing. So if the curtain don't fall and the creek don't rise, I'll be here next week. Good night.